What's up, everybody? I'm The Hook. And I'm The Blade. And welcome to the Luck Make Podcast, a show about all things making your own luck. <laughs> I'm your host, Lawson, joined as always by your host, Tim. And this week we're talking about everybody's favorite Lucky Charms mascot, Shea Patrick Cormack, and his game, Assassin's Creed Rogue. How have you been this week? How's your week been? Have you had a good week, dude? I just want to know about your week. Well, I got to say something something really good did happen. Um and I've kind of been riding on the high of it for a while now. My my favorite cereal is Honey Smacks. Honey Smacks? Yeah. I've never heard of that. It's got a, it's got like a DJ Frog as the mascot. Dude, I love frogs and DJs, so it sounds right up my alley. So, yeah, so Honey Smacks is my favorite cereal and I had gotten the banana nut Cheerios just to try, and I was so disappointed by those that I had to get some honey smacks, you know, to counteract the badness in my mouth. So I was at Publix, and I, the only honey smacks that they had was the family size. I don't need a, I don't need a six dollar box box of cereal. I just want the regular size. They didn't have the regular size, and so I look over and I see that they have a buy one get one for post cereal. And they have Golden Crisp, which is just like, you know, other other alternative universe Honey Smacks. And they have Honey Comb. So I was able to get two boxes of cereal for less than the family size box of the Honey Smacks, but also less than the, or pretty much the same price as the regular sized cereal. So I'm, I've been really happy about that. And the fact that I got two different boxes of cereal, like two different, actu- two different kinds of cereal. It's, it's just really nice. That sounds like you've had a great week. I can have a I can have a bowl of golden crisp and then I can have a bowl of honeycomb. I can switch it up, you know? I'm really happy for you. Honey bro. Smacks is is the definitive though. If no one has had it, go try it. If you have had it, then you can probably relate to my love of it, right? Say it in the comments. Let us know in the comments what you think about Honey Smacks. Couple notes at the top of the show for you guys. Valhalla's post-launch content trailer is out. Uh, talked about a couple new DLC expansions that we're going to see on the game after it releases. The funniest thing about it to me is that, fun fact, the Watch Dogs Legion post-launch content trailer actually has more Assassin's Creed in it than the post-launch trailer for AC Valhalla. Yeah, that's actually a really great observation. <laughs> <laughs> Something it's just, there really, there literally are more Assassin's Creed content in that Watch Dogs trailer said we won't get too deep into it because we spent all last week talking about Valhalla stuff. But uh, yeah, you know, Ireland and France should be fine, should be absolutely fine. No mythology based DLC, but there's also no like hidden ones based DLC either. So eh, eh. it is unfortunate that like Paris is popping up and, and, and we've already gotten a very amazing medieval Paris. In, in those riffs yeah. in Unity, and this one's going to suck, but it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, with this movement system, with this parkour, I don't know. We say it all the time, you know, like we, we've said it a billion times, but it's just really pathetic that it's like, is there a Hidden Ones DLC? Is there a Hidden Ones expansion? Like, when the Hidden Ones are the <laughs> focus of the fucking main game, right? Like, I don't know. It's just, I'm yeah. tired of saying it, but it's got to be said, right? Like. I also I also want to acknowledge uh, one comment that we received on last week's episode, All right. because this is something I, I do want to point out because I think it's really interesting. Let's do it. Uh, commenter Josh A pointed out to us. Yes, that there is actually uh, an explanation for what exactly is being said when we noticed that Darby and Stanislav had both tweeted. Right. You'll you'll regret your words and deeds, and and mentioning like the breathing skin shit, right? Like, well, yeah. Apparently, um, it's a reference to something that Kojima said about quiet in a Metal Gear Solid yeah. Five, which like I should have known. I should have known that. I, I know. I feel like we would have known that, but we didn't. Because I, I I guess it's just it's been so long since I I've, I've, I've played Metal Gear Solid Five, but yeah, totally. She breathes through her skin. But she also happens <laughs> to be super hot, 
So she gets to dress <laughs> down and to base in like um, like a bikini, pretty much, and it's okay. It, you know, it's it's all because right. everyone's like, this is not tactical clothing whatsoever, and is pretty gross sexualization of you know female character. And Kojima's like, no, 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 trust me. <laughs> There's a really good reason for it. Right. But it's like that almost illustrates better than anything else how when you work backwards from the end result to come up with the reason why that end result exists, right. the odds of that reason being anything other than a very transparent justification for the end result is pretty, pretty slim. It's like saying, cause I think no one is taking seriously the explanation that quiet breathes through her fucking skin as a, as a good reason to have her be that overly sexualized. Yeah. Because she could just be breathing through her skin and have like, an outfit that like shows her tummy, but no, like you can see her cleavage right in your nose. It's like to, for this character, uh, she's actually allergic to clothes. It's it's like saying that a female character can only see through her nipples <laughs> and she has to have them exposed to see. You don't want her not to see, right? Would Just you rather her? <laughs> would you rather her cover up her, her titties so that she, and, and be blinded to the world? You sexist pig. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's it's kind of ridiculous. I really wonder. I th- I've said before that like the standard I'm holding this whole gender, you know, option let the animus decide thing to is like will it will it give me a story or a mystery that's better than uh, you know, if there just wasn't that element at all. Now the standard I'm holding it to is it a better explanation than she breathes through her skin. That's fair. That's if fair. If it's not, I'm if it's not, I'm quitting the podcast. <laughs> and Nick Barish will take over. <laughs> He'll take over for both of us, actually. He'll be the, <laughs> he'll be the hook blade. Could you just he just he record he records one perspective and yeah. he responds to yeah. him himself with an, with I, another recording. I would listen to that. Absolutely. No no doubt. So wanna talk about Assassin's Creed Rogue Dude? Yeah, that, let's let's do it. You've never played it before. This is your first time. Your your rogue cherry has been popped. It got eclipsed for me by Unity because I had just gotten my uh, Xbox One at the time, and I was like, "Let's let's, let's just do Unity, dog." Like I I I saw no yeah. sense in playing Rogue. So, but yes, this is my first time, and I have some things to say about it. <laughs> What's your like headline impressions? Like if you were to sum it up in a sentence. Well, uh, I mean. <laughs> This isn't it probably isn't a very succinct sentence, but it moved up to number three on my list. Number three? Yeah. You it passed Black Flag? A thousand and ten percent. <laughs> no, don't do this to me, Tim. I can't host a podcast with you, dude. Is wait, so is Black Flag number four? Well, I I figure that the switching around, like probably Black Flag is above. Yes, is above Brotherhood and AC1. So I've got it at number four, probably. But how in what universe is Rogue better than Black Flag? Well, that's what we're going to talk about, right? It's the same. Oh, my God, dude. You are <laughs> the most infuriating person. I can't believe this shit. You. OK. All right. Even look, listen, accepting your one complaint invalid though it may be with the ending of ac4 you're not about to tell me that rogue has a better story right straight up no it, it, no it, it it honestly probably doesn't even have a better story than like brotherhood it's a very bad story we can at least agree on that no we definitely agree on that that's the thing so they give you a, a puckle gun instead of <laughs> and you're like better game <laughs> <laughs> they give you an ice ram and you're like better game <laughs> they put snow in it and that's that was all you needed well i have some pretty extensive notes and i think it i think it encapsulates all my issues with the game but also why i think it's better than black flag i have to know that's that's where we're starting because i have to know why you would think it's better than black flag well i mean i i guess i don't have like any one reason you know like i i have i have some things that i really loved so i could maybe just go from there right like yeah i'm saying start with those notes because i want you to i want you to convince me all right well so for the start i want to i guess i'll i guess i'll talk about lisbon okay oh lisbon works so well because it puts you in the selfish position of escaping Lisbon and leaving the 30,000 people to die. 
You have, and it's because of your actions. You can't stop and save anyone. Like in you know other missions, right, where shit like that's going down, there might be a little ob- uh, optional objective to save people. AC three had it. Revelations had it. But there's no option to do that at all. And you can't even stop long enough to look at things. You can't even like properly take in all of the destruction because you have to get the fuck out. And that's the thing is like you will also die, you know? And so I think it works better than the Cappadocia escape. And that's not a high bar. But it's also, interestingly enough, the complete inverse of the Monoregione attack. Because in Cappadocia, Ezio like just selfishly is like, fuck it, I'm going to blow it up. And he doesn't care about you know, if any citizens die or whatever, all he cares about is getting to Manuel. And in the Monteregioni attack, all of it is pretty reactionary. Like, you can say that it's it's Ezio's fault because of the events of AC2, but the game doesn't really want you to say that. So pretty much everyone that dies in that moment is is as a result of Cesare, not you. So you're you're pretty much detached from the fault. There's nothing that Ezio could have done to... Stop cannons from firing, you know, and and knocking down the city. But back to Shay, he inadvertently um, doomed this city. But he's also the only person probably there that has the ability to escape the destruction. He's a trained assassin. He's able to maneuver through the destruction. And with a little bit of luck, he gets out. Right. So you are dooming all these people to a fate. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, hey, fuck. Watch fuck your me. mouth. He makes his own luck. <laughs> he makes his own luck. <laughs> right. Well, with a little bit of luck that he made himself. <laughs> um, so that's the thing. It, it, I just think it's this beautiful, like, it perfectly puts you in the mindset of, like, his his guilt, but also his anger. Because while you can't say that he knowingly put these people in danger, it was his actions that 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 set that in motion. And he's also like the only person who was able to escape it. So he caused it, but also he alone is pretty much the sole survivor of it, you know? And it's, I was like, this is like, I just felt like, wow, I am so ready to get out of here, you know? But, and I'm not even like thinking to myself, like, what about all these people that I'm just leaving to die? Because I have no other choice. I would agree with your sentiment if it weren't for the fact that I feel like Lisbon, the the earthquake, it underwhelms as a story beat, Purely on the basis that I, as a player, am not at any point made to care about Lisbon. I'm not spending any time there. It doesn't emotionally affect me because... But that's why it works, You know, it's just another city. I don't think that's why it works. I think it's like like when they blow up Alderaan in, in Star Wars and, you know, we see that Princess Leia is bummed out, but we're not bummed out. However, if we'd actually been to that planet or had a reason to care about its existence, it might have been more emotionally effective on that level. Right. I feel like the Lisbon thing is aiming for that level of emotional effectiveness, but it doesn't pull it off because it's not a city that we're really meant to care about. I don't think the intention is because let's say if you spent like a sequence in Lisbon, right? Like there's something like on shows like in The Walking Dead or shows like that that have like really abrupt character deaths and all of a sudden that character is getting a lot of lines all of a sudden. You know something something's bad about something bad is about to happen. So, I think it adds to the shock shock value of it because if you if you think about it, the fact that okay, Shay is going to go get this piece of Eden, he knows exactly where it is. Everything's going well. He unlocks it, bam, and then tragedy strikes. And I think if if we hadn't have known about the Lisbon earthquake through trailers and whatnot, it would have been a little more effective because I, I did know it was coming, obviously. Right. I just don't think that the objective is is like, oh, care about this city. It's just like the destruction still felt real enough, even though I'd, I'd never been to Lisbon before, because I don't think that's what matters. I think it just matters that Shay caused this destruction and I think kind of being detached from it just a little bit, like not having been to Lisbon, I think that detachment actually kind of helps with the tone of of the scene because you can't stop and like be like, oh, no, the building that I loved, you know, or whatever. Like you you just yeah. you have to escape. And and I and I think I don't know. I just it, it, it works for me. I guess it does at the very least. It does accomplish the job of giving Shay a reason to want to leave the assassins. But my story issues with that whole beat are, you know, don't have much to do with Lisbon, to be honest. So it is pretty much the only like story element that I love. Right. So 
I think gotcha. besides that, there's just a lot of gameplay elements that put it above Black Flag for me. But definitely when it comes to Lisbon, I think it works really well. And I, I definitely see your point. The reason why we are still talking about Ezio's family, not the song, but his actual family, to this day is because they gave us time to connect with them. And then that loss is is all the more tragic. But I do think there's something to be said for this abrupt, this, this abrupt destruction that you maybe don't have so much ta- attachment to. But I think it does put you in the headspace of like, well, fuck this. I need to get out of here. I think your criticism is completely accurate. Um, I guess it just didn't it didn't ruin it for me, you know? That's fair. I, it is an effective set piece. I, I do enjoy playing it um, because it's cool looking and it's fun and it's exciting. But uh, I can't help but feel like if there was even a character with him that that died in the earthquake or something, that at least I would then care. I understand why Shay cares. I don't need to be convinced, for instance, that Shay cares about the earthquake and its destruction because, you know, people aren't sociopaths. They are going to feel emotions if they're directly involved with a catastrophe that kills, you know, many, many people. It's just the standards for, for compassion are higher in storytelling because you can't just show a person dying on a movie or game or TV show and expect me to feel an emotion as a result. There's all this legwork that storytellers have to do to get the audience invested in people and places and things in order for us to actually feel something when when something happens to them. I, I do think that the, the sequence could have been more effective in all of its goals had there been more emotional attachment to Lisbon. But I see your point that as far as the, the goals of the story are concerned, you can pretty much make the argument that it doesn't matter to the game whether we are emotionally affected by it. All we really need is a reason for Shay to want to leave the assassins, and it does uh, accomplish that. Yeah. So what are some of the like gameplay things that really got your dick hard for this game that put it above Black Flag? Well, pretty much, I think, I, I, I imagine, I think it's designed in a way to to make you do this, but in one, like, one of the first parts where you could actually free roam, you end up in front of this, little like lighthouse and you, you get off. And so me, I got off because there was an animus fragment there and, and I was still fooling myself thinking I was going to get all of them. <laughs> so I climb off my boat. I get onto this lighthouse. I climb up the top. I get the animus fragment and I get down to get back onto my boat and I look off and there's just this beautiful, like just orange tinted sky. And I see all the snowy mountains and just this beautiful landscape. And and that really solidified to me, like, it made me feel like I was, like, playing AC2 again, where I just could see this, like, really beautiful landscape, and I want to, like, go explore and go further into it, and just the atmosphere and the vibe of this game, I so much prefer over the West Indies and whatnot, and and while that is very effective at doing that, it's just, as a setting, I so much prefer the North Atlantic and the River Valley and the colonial stuff that that, that pops up in there. I think it does more with that stuff better, way more than AC3 could have done, too. I think, it, I, I guess, on a, as a purely subjective thing, I completely disagree with you. Like, I find the AC4 West Indies, like, tropical vibe and, like, the sandy areas and the really bright blue water ocean reflections and, and the, you know, the lush green environments. Like, I found all of that a lot. I, I had that, that moment you describe of, like, feeling awe as you look at a landscape. I had that all the time in AC4. I just didn't have that in Rogue because I am not particularly invested in the whole colonial time period as a setting. And honestly, the you know, the sort of last gen graphics of the game I felt like got in the way compared to playing AC4 on a PC or playing it on next gen. So but that's that's like a purely taste subjective sure. thing, just what setting appeals to you more. So I can understand why that works for you and why it doesn't work for me. I also think that there's okay, so it has very like intricate and in-depth exploration into it. So I felt like with Black Flag, obviously the main allure is the piracy, and that's also where a lot of your economy comes from. You get a lot of your you, you get most of your goods from doing that. And the reason for exploring other things is sometimes for the collectibles and treasure and whatnot. But I felt like Rogue incentivized, for me at least, more reason to get off of my boat. And I and I can't quite put my finger on what that is. The collectibles are not that worthwhile. So it's not really even the collectibles. 
I definitely like was going after like some cave paintings and stuff. And but um, one experience I had is I got onto a location. I got off my boat. I found the collectible. It's then, a ship, Timothy. Sorry, 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 sorry. You're right. A boat can fit on a ship, but a ship can't fit on a boat. So I got off my ship and I, I went to go get this collectible. And then there's the like little frontier skirmishes that you can fall into. And I saw that there's a supply camp up here. So I went to the su- supply camp. And then I realized that, oh, there's another supply camp over here. And eventually, before I knew it, I had traversed through four different locations without getting back onto my ship. I was able to go to these two locations on this piece of land, which are which are two different like fast travel points entirely. I was able to cross the river with with, with that new mechanic. And, I, and then I was able to go to like two different other locations in this forest and an hour went by until I realized, wow, I haven't been back on the Morgan in, in a while. There are two things that I really appreciate about Rogue that you've that you've hit on here. One is that the land based gameplay does give you a lot more to do than in Black Flag because the cities are much larger and mm-hmm. more densely populated. And there's just more fun, classic AC land based gameplay in Rogue than in Black Flag. And I also think that when you talk about the collectibles and you're, you're kind of hitting on the, the sort of way that locations are designed in this game and the level design of them and the experience of Rogue presents for me, probably in the series, the most fun experience I've ever had just collecting everything. Most of the Assassin's Creed games at some point or another, I've gone through and just collected everything 100% of the game. And with Rogue, I had the most fun doing that. So there's definitely something to be said for that. Well, and that's the thing, too, is I kind of got lost in the exploration. Not because that's the thing, right? Is I wasn't like, wow, I can't wait to get this next cave painting. I was just really yeah. into the the ability that I felt like I got completely lost in this little area and the little frontier skirmishes and the little like, you know, saving hostages and and, and like the random like settlements that you would come by and stuff. It all kept m- me on my toes. And here's something I found is probably at like the 40 minute mark of this exploration little trip I did. I found there was like a French settlement nearby that I, I had to take over for the British. And there was a little group of guards like s- securing the perimeter. I took them out and I realized I'm kind of low on, re- on, on ammo. So I, I looted their bodies and then I successfully took the settlement. If you make me actually loot a body out of necessity in Assassin's Creed game, you're doing something right, right? Like it completely satisfied that fantasy of me where I'm like going through this area in this wilderness and killing people and and fucking taking over uh, shit for the British. And it was like I, I just I was so surprised at myself because I had never looted ammo, ammo <laughs> off of a, off of a body this much before, you know, and and so I was because I knew I was under equipped to go take out this settlement. So I needed more ammunition. And so I've definitely had to do it a bunch in AC three and AC four. So I can't say I have the same experience. with. Well, that. I had to do it a lot. I had to do it in AC four, too, because, you know, you get more darts and stuff. But I did it more in this game. I and, But also I didn't want to break the fantasy and fast travel away. I wanted to keep like I wanted to stay where I yeah. was and, and get somewhere and, and, and kind of conquer it and then get back to my ship. So, Mm -hmm. and and this kind of gets into a complaint, right? Is like, why the fuck am I as Shay Cormac deciphering cave paintings and collecting Viking swords? All of the collectibles are not based. There's no connection to the character. So on the one hand, it's beautiful and amazing and and it's, it's endless amounts of fun. But on the other hand, why the fuck am I doing it? You know, it's like, it's like what we talk about with Arno and the murder mysteries. Why? You know, yeah. what's the why? Like, why is he solving mysteries? I think you're hitting on something that, cause I haven't really said like what my one sentence headline impression of rogue would be. And really it's just that it's a total mixed bag because while it has the probably best gameplay experience in the Kenway trilogy, it definitely has a very, very bad story. And I have a lot of complaints about that story that I'm sure I will get a chance to get more thoroughly into in this episode. You know, if this had had a phenomenal story and it really was just super emotionally effective and, and you know, deep characterization and well thought out, like I could see it being better than Black Flag for me. But Black Flag's story is still the best story, in my opinion, in the entire franchise. So Rogue being as fairly dog shit as it is by comparison 
can't really hold a candle. And there's a lot of like AC three tier bad writing in this game. And I think probably what it speaks to more than anything else, our disagreement on this, on this game is going to be that like story for me is the most important part. It is the thing I care about the most. You can give me a game like origins with pretty interesting, well thought out and well developed gameplay and give it the story that origins has. And it's going to go at the bottom of my list straight up. Right. But I'm sensing that that may not quite be the case for you. I don't know, because part of me, like, I don't know, because I do feel like the reason why Revelations, because it has so, such great gameplay, but the reason why it's my favorite is because the story has stuck with me throughout, you know, the 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 nine years since I've played it the first right. time. Right, and Revelations and Rogue are really interesting to compare because they're both sort of the conclusion of their respective trilogies, and Revelations achieves what it achieves, in my opinion, as it's, it's, you know, I think it's the number three game on my list, right? Um, so, you know, pretty similar there. The way that Revelations achieves what it achieves is it does have the best gameplay in the Ezio trilogy. It also has a great story, you know? Right. And I give AC2 the second place spot because I find that it edges out on story. It does well, that, well, and that's why it definitely, like, is my number two AC2 because it, it edges out... It, it doesn't even edge out. It, it demolishes a rogue in story. And, but I also think it's better than Black Flag in story. But so does Black Flag. But but Black Flag's story didn't knock my socks off like it does you. So that's why it's not my number three anymore. So Yeah, and, which I think is just because you're a contrarian prick, but go on. I can't say that Black Flag has a bad story, but did it do any, did it do any more for me than Rogue Story? Not really. So at the end of the day... But you got to at least you got to at least admit, even if like even if the ending underwhelmed you on an on an emotional level, you at least can tell. And I know you are, you have a sense for story that you're not like you can at least tell structurally and and on a level of character arcs that that Black Flag is. No, I, I, supreme, I, I, right? I know. Yes, for sure. But I feel like Black Flag was my number three. Not because of its objectively good story qualities, but because of the gameplay. Like, there are things okay. that are objectively good story qualities in AC1, but the gameplay kind of irritates me at parts. That's why it's down, I think, right. at number six? Yeah? I yeah. think six, because I, I, I have some things that moved around, obviously, but... Um, <laughs> we got we to gotta completely reassess our list here yeah, pretty soon. Yeah, but, um, like in Brotherhood, the gameplay is just improved AC2 with some pretty shitty level design, but ultimately it's just improved AC2. But in terms of story, it sucks. But the story is so, so underwhelming. Yeah, I mean, because because you could because for you, you like Odyssey more than Origins simply because the story is a little bit better, right? Yes. For me, I feel like if I had played those two games, I would just re I would begrudgingly like like I would just have Origins as my favorite. Simply because it's 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 even it's slightly more of an AC game than Odyssey is, you know what I mean? Yeah. So while Rogue is an exception, I think the story pretty much sucks on almost every level. It doesn't work, but it hits my number three because the gameplay experiences, like you know, really really uh, impacted me more than Black Flag did, and because Black Flag isn't like for me the all time best AC story, I have to only compare the gameplay stuff, right? And so that's why it's number three on my list. If I was comparing story and, and only story, Black Flag would obviously be three, right? But I just think there's so much about Rogue in terms of gameplay that I had such a fun time with and more fun than Black Flag. You don't think you might even put Black Flag above two on a story level? Oh, no. Given your complaints with the ending of AC2 are a lot more <laughs> structural than the, you know, AC2. I think, I think my, complaints. yeah, I mean, AC2's ending pretty much sucks. But what salvages it is the Minerva stuff, right? Right, right. Yeah, but my other complaint though about is like there's not a much there's not much connection to the world with with Shay as a, it says as a character, but with Black Flag, like everything that you were doing makes sense because it's something that you could feasibly say Edward would do, right? Yeah, and that's kind of where I know that you have a complaint of like, excuse me, the pirate fantasy kind of works better for that game than the privateer fantasy. <laughs> Yeah. That this game has. Yeah. One of my big complaints with Rogue is that there's not a very effectively conveyed central fantasy to the game. There's not like a single sort of, you know, thing I can really hone in on because it's not really nailing the Templar fantasy, which it aims at, but it doesn't really achieve. 
because it's you know it's you're you're playing as a templar but the game is still an assassin's creed game you're still doing all the assassin stuff and i'm just not sure how well that tracks with what i would expect the templar experience to be like especially considering most other templars that you'll see or interact with in any of the ac games are not necessarily themselves doing assassin shit right there's not really a templar fantasy that's achieved here you, I guess you could say that like working with people who normally would be your adversaries as an assassin is part of the Templar fantasy, but you're really just an assassin with that's wearing a cross. And and it comes back to I feel like with with Rogue and with Shay and and the whole Templar experience in the game is that it could have been the gameplay wise it could have been the same as it currently is, and still fed more of the idea of a Templar fantasy if it allowed you to be evil. If the Templars are evil, you know, and obviously, look, let me be very clear before I get too in on this, on this idea. I love the idea that the Templars and the Assassins, it's not morally, you know, black and white. There are degrees and and pretty much in all of the history of the franchise, most of the, the best Templar characters thought that they were doing the right thing and thought that they were good people. And obviously the Templar experience in a game like this should reflect that. But what they've done on a story and gameplay level is pretty much for just one game, flip things around and make it so that the assassins are doing a bad thing and the Templars are doing a good thing. And I just think it could have been more interesting if they leaned into it and said, okay, for this game as a Templar, you're going to do things that are bad. The kind of things you would expect the Templar to do in any other Assassin's Creed game when they do things that are bad. And and usually that's the extent of, you know, say, finding a piece of Eden that can be used to control the masses. Buying into the idea of controlling the masses should be part of the character and part of the game, but they ignore it for the entire duration of this story. At no point is the idea of we're going to control people to make a better world. At no point do you actually have to grapple with that ideology. I think that if this was a more realistic story in terms of logical cause and effect chains, right? When Shay leaves the assassins for the reasons that he does leave the assassins, which is that, Hey, if I stay with this group of people, they could be putting people's lives in danger. And I don't want to be involved with that. That I think they almost, they almost make that work. I don't think they completely do because the turn from I'm a devoted assassin to I'm going to now fuck up the assassins or, or even just I'm going to leave, that turn is handled very, very poorly. It goes over in I a think flash. this also represents some of the like identity crisis that this game has. Like the marketing yeah. is, I'm an assassin hunter. But yet, like... You're not really hunting people. You're kind of just killing your old friends. Like, yeah. I d- and what I was trying to get at is I don't see then how this Shay who's left the assassins pretty much joins the Templars without a second word because they gave him some clothes. I mean, does he ever stop to think that like the things that the Templars want that he knows they want because he's been in the organization that fights them for years? Why doesn't he realize that that pretty much means They're still the same organization just because one of them has done something nice for him. Why does he now think that they're not the same evil that they, that he knew? Well, well, that's the thing. Like I, I have, I have something incredibly similar written down here. It's like Shay. Sometimes I can't even say he always does. Cause sometimes he struggles with, with having to kill his old friends and his old mentors and stuff. Yeah. But he, he, he's never at all ideologically challenged his, his, his explanation to Liam is that he did it to save the world. You know, you can't argue with that, right? Like, do the Templars never do anything that's going to harm the world? I mean, maybe sometimes, right? That could have been cool if Shay was kind of keeping other Templars in check, you know? And and he kind of does this with Haytham. Like, ring the Templars back in and maybe be a force that can make the Templars better. Right. Or at least acknowledge what they do that's wrong. I mean, they, they flirt with that when, when it's revealed to Shay that that Colonel Monroe essentially helped him knowing that he was an assassin the whole time. And there's the implication that, you know, maybe, maybe Shea has been manipulated into this, that maybe he's been coerced, taken advantage of really by someone who was not being completely forthright with him about his motivations, that that should maybe inspire a feeling in Shea of hold on. Maybe you guys are actually being kind of shady. 
it doesn't just like kind of with, with, with Connor, you know, in the context of George Washington, like you want that moment to mean that they make a change in how they are and who they're siding with, but it doesn't really do that. Instead, he's just like, ah, oh, well, you know, people are complicated. Monroe's a good buddy and we're going to write cutesy letters to each other until he dies in a fire. Well, that's the thing is Shay only joins up with the Templars so that they can sponsor him. Like they're sponsoring his trip around the world yeah. to kill people. Like that's not him choosing the I- ideology of the Templars. He never even represents the ideology to his former assassins, even when they question why he's made the switch. You know, he's never like, because yeah. the Templars are the way to the to a freer world or whatever. Like he doesn't even he, he doesn't adopt the ideology. He's also he's also never right. challenged either by his other people, like or, or, or just challenged in general. Shay the entire game is doing what he sees is right. He's never doing something that he doesn't ultimately think he has to do. Of course, like hope hope really didn't give him any other options, but any remorse or any feelings of doubt about that is immediately brushed off by by Gist. It kind of absolves him of his sins, right? Usually in a good story, and I've mentioned this on the podcast before, especially, you know, when we're talking about like Ezio and Brotherhood, for instance, your character is going to begin by making fundamental assumptions about the world. And in a traditional story, the the circumstances that play out are going to challenge their belief. And at the end, their belief is either stronger or it's refuted, right? And we have Shay. He begins this story with a fundamental belief that what the assassins are doing is killing, you know, people is, is bad for the world. And typically what you would see as a result of that being your first act headspace is that by the end of the game, you've changed your mind a little bit. Like usually he would, in a traditional story, realize that the Templars are bad too. I think the only thing that stopped this game probably from involving that and having the Templars be equally as bad, if not more so, is that then it can't end with him killing Charles Dorian. And I think they really wanted to do that, right? But if that's going to be the end point, then the headspace at the beginning has to be different. And him becoming a Templar should be a decision he makes maybe closer to the end of the game. But obviously then that doesn't make for a great selling point of here's the game where you play as a Templar. So I get it. I think it would have been difficult. I think that with the circumstances that they provide us in this game, with the explanation of the earthquake in Lisbon, it already is stretching my suspension of disbelief. First of all, that the assassins would continue to do this thing that they know is harming people if they understood what was happening. I think that, you know, you can make the case that when Adewale talks about what happened in, uh, was it Port-au-Prince or Principe, um, that they're then making the choice to keep pursuing them anyway. But I don't get the impression that they fully understand what's going to happen is that there's going to be an earthquake. And I think if they did understand that, if they were given a chance to understand that, they would know that they shouldn't keep doing what they are doing. Well, yeah, and it, but it also completely goes gives validity to the to the, to the fact that like Shay doesn't have any form of like concrete reason why he's joining the Templars because it's because it's not yeah. his ideology. It's just well, the assassins were mean to me, so I guess I'm going to join these guys. Like I think a lot of this could have been solved. And the very first thing he does is he steals the manuscript, and he gets caught stealing the manuscript. What is he what is his relationship like with with Achilles and with the assassins that he wouldn't think to just talk to them about it? Yeah, it's like he goes in like like he goes in there and he's like Achilles you cheated you cheated on my <laughs> with my wife. Like you had an affair <laughs> with my wife. Like he like it, okay, it makes complete sense why he's angry. <laughs> but the fact that he doesn't go there and he's like guys, yeah. it was terrible. There was an earthquake. He immediately assumes that they put him up to it on purpose. Right. And they conversely immediately are like, you're trying to steal from us. You're betraying the brotherhood. We're going to now shoot you off yeah, of the cliff <laughs> instead of being like, Shay, Shay, calm down. Shay, calm what down. are you doing? Talk Stop it. Us. What happened? That's the thing too, right? Is there's, it's never once, it's never once suggested that the Templars might be a, an equal harm for the world, right? Like, I think the story could have. It's also just because they've been written not to be because if you have Haytham finding out about this whole thing and being like, oh, by God, that's terrible. 
we should stop the assassins from doing this horrific thing. When I think we know pretty well that like the Templars are going to be, if there's anything that the assassins are interested in with those, with those, whatever they're called, spiky balls of Eden, like the Templars are going to want that shit too. They always have. Uh, well, the tree of Eden, the trees of Eden. Yeah. The Templars aren't hearing one guy say it's terrible. They, they caused earthquakes and being like, Oh, then let's never investigate them ourselves and leave them be and stop the assassins. They, they want to take them for themselves. They don't want to they, they, they don't want to hide them. They want to use them for themselves. That, right. That's what Templars do. That's what they've always done. So they've now created a game where the assassins are uncharacteristically, you know, bizarrely motivated. The fact that they still want to be seeking out these trees when they know what's going to happen. And the Templars are equally like, We've just made them into good guys. They're all jolly, happy, wax museum good guys, and they're just so boring, but ultimately they're just not what you would expect the Templars to be like, and that makes it a really disappointing Templar game. It's very manipulative when you consider all the Templars that we've seen, even the even the kind of good ones would still kill you any chance they got. You know, like the Templars yeah. are, you know, the, and, and that's the thing is, is the best Assassin's Creed games play with that the dichotomy in the in, in the gray area. And so it would have been nice if there was completely evil pricks on the Templar side and completely good guys that you struggle with killing on the assassin side. But what they did, they've just manipulated you into being okay with killing the assassins and being okay with being on the Templar side. And, and because you as a player and Shay himself never struggles with these decisions, it's a very milk toast Templar game. That's why, you know, we kind of floated around this idea. I think... This game would have benefited from being from, from Shay being the guy who's kind of making his third party group where he just kills both sides and whoever he sees is, is, a, is a problem. That would have been more interesting. Or even just playing a game where you are a Templar for the entire game and you're not necessarily a rogue assassin could have that been too, interesting. That too. But I think they could have just. I think they could have done exactly what they wanted to and just given us a better reason to leave the assassins and actually, yes, explored the ideology. If you take the time with it and you give the character an ideological reason to support the Templars, then as a player, I can maybe support the Templars and I can play as that character and have a good time. But instead, this game just wants to ignore the ideology part entirely. And so I'm, as a player, I have to second guess everything Shay's doing the entire time because I'm thinking... Wait a second, but I know that the Templars want to control the world. Does Shay know that the Templars want to control the world? Is he down he with should, that? He should know that. Because we don't know. Well, here's another thing, Lawson. He, he should. I wouldn't think he'd be down with that. But, uh, here's another thing. Is the entire time, right, like instead of Shay being down with that and having to come to grips with like being down with the control of the world, they still make him a hero regardless. Like he's, Shay is completely worth rooting for if you consider that without him, the world's going to fall to all these earthquakes and the assassins are going to ruin the world and et cetera. I don't buy that. But if, if you're operating on that assumption, then Shay is absolutely in which Shay is always operating on that assumption. Then Shay is a hero, but the ending of the game, which is seemingly what they really wanted to do so badly that they did all of this when Shay's like being this like kind of evil prick and he's like killing Charles and he's like, we're going to start a revolution of our own. It's like, that's, that's not very like, that, that right there is like genuine Templar shit, right? That's like real villain shit, especially if, you know, you know about Unity already, you know what happens to his dad, and you are fucking hearing the kids playing, mm -hmm. you're hearing them talking about apples and shit, and you're standing there knowing that you're about to orphan this fucking kid. Not that Shay knows that, but we do. So why are we pretending that it's not an element that we are, that we're being villainous, that we're doing things that are, you know, going to harm people? You could talk about that and it could be interesting. All of the marketing points towards that being the case too, is that like Shay was going to be this ruthless motherfucker because he's walking up on an old yeah. friend of his, which for all intent, like in the, in the original cinematic, for all intents and purposes, that could have, that, that was basically Altair, that striking image of him pointing a <laughs> right. rifle at an assassin <laughs> that, you know, it's basically like, this isn't your, this isn't your grandma's assassin's creed. We're, we're fucking killing us. We're out here killing, we're killing assassins. assassins now, but yet. That's not the game. What you're doing is you're saving the world. You're not going around killing assassins because you because you want to. Yeah. You're doing it because you think it's going to save the world. And 
that's noble, I guess, but it's not really like, it doesn't fulfill that Templar fantasy, right? Like it would have been really interesting too, is if they really like leaned into it really hard and like found new gameplay systems that to support the Templar fantasy, like maybe you can't leap of faith, you know, like maybe you can't do these things and they find other things to put in its place. Mm -hmm. Obviously I know why they didn't do that because it's basically black flag, but with rogue skin. But I just think if you're really, if you're really doing the Templar fantasy, there are things I think that you need to remove. Like, I think it would be interesting to see how a Templar would handle this because basically you handle it like an assassin, right? Like, all of the stuff yeah. is handled like an assassin would, but with the Templar, you know, flair, you know? I mean, I think Darby said once that, like, a Templar game wouldn't look like an Assassin's Creed game. It'd look like a like an RTS or, a, you know, a strategy game because what Templars are doing day to day is they're manipulating seats of power and they're right. controlling things. And, like, they could have introduced, I think, an element of that into this game, like as a side thing that that Assassin's Creed likes to do with little gimmicks about controlling, you know, populations or controlling your environment. Could have even gone a little bit proto like Watchdogs on it if, you know, because Watchdogs is all about giving you systemic control of your surroundings. If the Templars had systemic control of their surroundings in a more indirect way that that in, that makes the game more engaging, that could have been really cool to see too. But I get that we're holding this, you know, six sequence spinoff game by Ubisoft Sophia to pretty high standards when we talk about things right. like that. What's not holding them to a high standard? How about this segue, huh? is expecting them to write characters that don't suck because when you think about comparing this game to AC4 and regardless of your personal feelings about AC4 or its ending, you have to admit that the cast of likable side characters from Blackbeard to Horn of Gold to Vane, all those Steed, all those people are really good, right? No, absolutely. Uh, the actual, the, the, the most like impactful scene in Black Flag for me was when Steed was like, the courage you have instilled in me, I will never forget. Like, it was just so nice to see. I, I really appreciated that scene. Yeah, I, I I felt like really affected when I think I only realized on this last playthrough that I'm pretty sure when you're watching like Mary and yep, Anne, they say like, he fucking died. They say he fucking died. He, yeah, he was hanged or whatever. Fucking steed. Anyway, though, um, the characters in this game all universally suck. And here's <laughs> why. Uh, you have Christopher Gist, you have Colonel Monroe, you have uh, all these people on the Templar side, even Haytham. Haytham was the one character in AC3 who was immune from the Wax Museum character writing of that game. And in this game, he is a victim of it because Haytham is such a boring motherfucker in this game. It is unbelievable. Haytham straight up sucks in this game. He never says anything cool or funny or interesting. He does not have a personality besides being like, I'm the Grand Master of the Templars. You'll listen to what I'm saying. I mean, in in AC3, he has lines like, now I'm going to feed you your teeth. Where's that, Haytham? What, did, what yeah, happened the whole time, The whole time, he's just kind of like your boss that comes in to, to check on you quarterly, you know? And all of the all of the other characters who are Templars that you interact with are like happy tree friends. They're just like, you know, Christopher Gist, who's like, Hey there, Shay, we're going to do some privateering today. Isn't that great? (laughs) Don't we love the Templars? (laughs) It's wonderful. (laughs) I'm having such a good time. (laughs) When they ask me about hell freezing over, I will remember these days fondly. (laughs) Ah, Shay, we've been friends for like a year. You've really changed my life for the better. (laughs) And like Colonel Monroe is like, hello, it's me, Colonel Monroe. I got you some clothes and uh, don't these gangs suck? Like they're all just really (laughs) boring. They're really, they're not characters the way that those, those pirate friends were. They're, they're just completely flat. And the assassins, dude. I'm pretty sure that you could take all of the speeches that they give at the end when they're being killed in those memory corridors, everything they say, you could mix and match like blindly. You could read any one of those memory corridors and without certain giveaway, like plot circumstances, you would never be able to tell who said what, because they could have all said the exact same thing. They're all the same character. Liam, Hope, Kasigawase, Chevalier, they're all just boring assassin mouthpieces basically there's also not any kind of an explanation why the assassins in the last what two years have 
devolved into gangs. Like, there's an explanation, like, why has that happened? And none of the assassins even explain it. It's just, they are supporting gangs that go and rob people blindly. It's like, that's so uncharacteristic. And why are they wearing burnt orange? What the fuck is up with that color? It's so uncharacteristic, dude. Yeah, it's very strange, especially when you consider that Rogue, as as one of its core conceits, is like, look, the assassins are doing gang shit now. They're terrorizing the public. We should be really fucking upset about this. And then we know that like two years later, no, a year later, we're playing Syndicate, and it's like, <laughs> the assassins have a gang now, dude. It's so cool. <laughs> it's so fun and cool to have a gang. Don't you love it? Okay, so basically... I rewatched some of the marketing for this game, and I realized that a lot of the scenes, they seem to hide the fact that Shay is an assassin in some of those scenes. They put him in the Templar gown and stuff if for some of the scenes, like the scene where he's talking yeah. to Achilles about the manuscript and he steals it and whatever. And that, that really made me realize that from the first part of the game where, you're, where you steal the manuscript from Achilles, you don't talk to Achilles again until the end of the game. Like... Yeah. We talk about this all the time. We talked about it with Cesare and Ezio. The fact that every single time Liam and Achilles are just are just slipping through your fingers, you know, they're just out of your grasp. It made me think that like if Shay had been a Templar by this point and he's and he's arguing with Achilles about the manuscript and he's arguing with Achilles about the trees of Eden, it would have made a lot more sense as to like their conflict. But they just disappear from each other. And then at the end of the game, suddenly you're like, Achilles is like, damn, he wasn't lying. These really do cause earthquakes. And it's like, why, like, what gave you that information? If there was a clash constantly, like back and forth of like, Shay is like, you're wrong. And Achilles is like, you're wrong. That one would have challenged his ideology change. It would have given the finale more impact. Yeah. Like, why do I care if he's about to stab Achilles if we've only seen Achilles for like five minutes of this game? So that, that to me yeah. is one manipulative but it's just like it's it's such a missed opportunity because you could have had Shay consistently encountering Achilles or Liam, and Liam would have been the character yeah. to call Shay out on his bullshit. But they don't have any of that. Like you know, another missed opportunity is why don't you have like Liam like mourning Shay? Shay disappears. They they think he's dead, right? And no character is affected by that. We don't see any character be like, man, I miss Shay. You know. So it just takes the humanity out of all of the assassins. Shay was flawed, but he was a brother. Yeah. No, 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 no. no. Well, that's the thing, right? Is like I, I was picturing him like he was like tailing Liam. And it turns out he's tailing Liam to like his grave. And it's Shay's like a Shay's grave. And he's like mourning over him. And that would have made it fucking hard to have to kill him, right? But no, we just don't see Liam ever again. And when we do, he's like, what would Shay know? He's a dumbass. <laughs> and he causes the earthquake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's like, aren't you guys with your childhood best friends? Shouldn't shouldn't Shay's betrayal not be a matter of assumption? Shouldn't you interact with Shay as a Templar and him and like, okay, imagine that you are like have like you you come you cross paths with, with Liam and he finds out that you're alive and he sees you in a Templar outfit and he's like. Yeah. Like, wouldn't that rock Liam's world? That would have been actual, like, like really, that would have been really good shit. But instead of who who discovers him, Gisegawase, who dies almost instantly afterwards. You know? It's just, I yeah. think it would have been dope if, you know, we see kind of Liam mourning him and maybe even Achilles because Achilles needs some fucking humanity in this game. And then we realize, then Liam crosses paths with Shay and he's like, holy fuck, you're alive. And you're a Templar. My world is turned upside down. And then actually fighting him at the end yeah. would have been a really difficult thing to do. Nothing in this game mm -hmm. is difficult to do because Shay is the hero who's saving the world. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I mean, here's like... <laughs> <laughs> Here's the notes I wrote for this for this episode. I wrote story sucks, hate them sucks, Christopher Gist sucks, Shay sucks. Make my own luck is a stupid catchphrase. Gameplay pretty fun though. Let's talk about that dude. Make my own luck. It pissed me off more on this playthrough than it ever has before. Like I used to be, I used to be a defender. I used to make excuses for it. I'd be like, but it sounds kind of cool. But no, when he says 
I'll make, I make my own look like he's really like, what does that fucking mean, dude? What does it mean? Anytime anyone says, Hey, good luck. He, la- he acts like they've offended him personally. And he's like, wait a second. Did you just say good luck? I'll have, you know, I make my own look. It's stupid. It's dumb and bad. I hate it. Yeah. Basically when it, it, it's not just in terms of like, like no one's saying just sh- like, like if someone said to Shay, Hey, good luck, then that would make some sense. But when Haytham is like, with a little bit of luck, we should do this just fine. And he's like, I make me own luck. And Haytham's like, well, I don't, we need some luck. All right. Like, <laughs> Well, I don't actually. I don't have monopoly on luck, Shay. So I don't. I don't own a single luck factory, Shay. <laughs> I'm in possession of no man-made luck, and I'd appreciate it if you understood that. <laughs> or or Haven's like, I'll, well, I'll, then stop I'll, hogging it. I'll send you some in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I'll expedite some luck <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus <laughs> with, with two day shipping <laughs> yeah it's it's terrible it's like it, turn, it turns out that uh, <laughs> it turns out that having luck and the way that you acquire it are separate things <laughs> it's just it just doesn't make sense as a response to something like like yeah that's a great example they were just looking for reasons to have him say it throughout the game so that it could be his catchphrase but like there's no like explanation for it like is there a backstory about Shay being particularly lucky or unlucky and and also i have to point out you know this is something i don't think we've mentioned in the podcast but we've talked about it before uh, somebody suggested in the development of AC4 that they should bring back the hook blade from Revelations. And Darby was like, no, we're not going to bring back the hook blade because having a pirate with a hook for a hand is such a cliche. And you get the sense that like anyone other than Darby would have been like, oh, oh hooks, pirates. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Right. And that's exactly what happened on Rogue. That They're like, oh, we're, we have an Irish protagonist. Let's give him a catchphrase about luck. How <laughs> stereotypical can you possibly be for this Irish dude to care a whole heck of a lot about luck? Well, I get that there's probably something to be said for that being a stereotype, but it's very on the nose. Just like having a pirate with a hook blade would have been very on the nose. So, it you know, don't do it. It would have been interesting if he was actually particularly unlucky and sure. he was constantly just like dealing with it by making his own luck, you know, like, or if it meant something other than just a a cliche, he could throw out like, what's an example of him doing something that makes his own luck. (laughs) What's an example of an action that he takes where he's like, I have to, you know, if you interpret it as being prepared for something and not relying on luck to, to bring you success, it's a fine thing to believe in. But he never really is doing that, right? So, yeah, I just, uh, I, you know, and yeah, there's just not any explanation for the gang shit. But that being said, though, you know, the uh, for most of the game, I really enjoyed the like assassin uh, system where you had to like find the assassins and kill them before they killed you. Oh yeah, that's super fun. I dig that. Oh, also, I I was waiting to do the pot. I was into the do the episode on this for me to tell you. Did you know? You know how when you do the eagle vision, yeah. you have a little compass. I know what you're about to say. I know what you're about to say. I well, yeah. So I so I so you are aware that it's a multiplayer thing. Yes. Yeah, and the whispers, it's 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 one to one the multiplayer experience because the whispers are are in the multiplayer when someone's near you and the compass is putting you toward your target. It's it's all uh, AC classic AC multiplayer stuff. So I do enjoy the way it exists in Rogue at the start of the game. You're like, oh shit, they're near me, you know. And after a while, you start you start like knowing where to look and what hiding spots yeah. and whatnot. What's also really cool is it's is it's where you as an assassin would hide. Yeah. So you know where to look after a while because like, well, if it were me, I'd be in those bushes, right? And so I just think that's a really cool way, and and that would have been interesting. And so that actually does add some coherence to you being a former assassin a former assassin yeah because you know totally the tactics right you know you know what they're gonna pull on you 
I also just really enjoy a lot of the tools that they added for this game. Like the grenade launcher is a no brainer. It works perfectly. The air rifle is pretty much the same as the darts from AC4, but having the uh, firecracker dart is a really nice addition that gives you a lot more possibilities in stealth contexts. Also, you know, the free aiming puckle gun is brilliant. That should have been the case from minute one of naval gameplay, but it took them a while to figure that out. And, uh, like, I wish that we could retrofit them into AC4. I also like that there's a little circle that expands out from you when you whistle. I think this is the only game that does that. It's kind of funny to me that, like, that is the best implementation of whistling. And when AC3 Remastered gave you the uh, ability to whistle in bushes, they didn't also keep that element of it, which is presumably the best way it's been. Yeah, done. it kind of combines the, like, syndicate sound wave meter with the whistling. It's It's really cool. And... It's nice yeah. because you have no indication in AC in, in the previous games just how far your whistle can go, right? So it, it is, it, yeah. it's a nice thing. You know, the other thing about Naval, too, is I actually found myself enjoying the Naval in this game a little bit more simply because you have the narrower uh, oh, seas so that you have to kind of like be on your toes and not hit the, 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 the land and, and the icebergs are cool. But also, I noticed that because there was so many other places that I could get resources and money because this game does have a pretty good economy system. I was like doing the gang hideouts also helped me get money to be able to get resources doing the supply camps and the settlements helped me with like resources and whatnot. And so I wasn't always relying on going and finding a man of war to yeah. go and, 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 and uh, plunder. And so by the end of the game, I was still enjoying the naval experience because I wasn't tired of it. With Black Flag, I got kind of tired of it because that was the most efficient way to get to get stuff, right? Yeah. I also want to point out, as far as things that I do like, that I actually, like, as far as story goes, I know you said you like the Lisbon thing. For me, I do really like the final confrontation with Achilles and Liam and Haytham. Yeah. I like the way that it plays out, like, on a structural level. I like the way that, like... The, the assassins realize what's going on, but they still kind of fuck it up accidentally. And then Haytham shooting Achilles in the leg is a super satisfying moment, especially because the timing of it is like, it's so brilliant because you see the end screen yep. for the mission and you're like, continue. And then he's like, bam. And you're just like, yeah. oh, that's how it happened. It's amazing. I'm it's pretty amazing. sure. Don't they kind of tease? Doesn't in the fight with Shay and Achilles towards the beginning, doesn't it kind yeah. of seem like he hurts his leg? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's because, yeah, because he, he kicks his leg a little bit and, and you're like, oh, yeah. that's how it happens. But then he's back on his feet and you're like, oh, maybe not. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. that was that was really great um, moment there at the end. Like that almost the, the satisfaction of that conclusion, plus then going on to the you know, Charles Dorian memory, like bringing it very like full circle in a satisfying way. Like, like it made me think the story was better than it actually was the first time I played it, because I do think that structurally, like it's really interesting to compare what makes rogue bad versus what makes AC three bad, because they're pretty much different diseases. Like they're different problems in those games. AC three structurally is fucked. It's got the weirdest, strangest, like, Starting off with, you know, having like six sequences of tutorial content and all of that stuff. Like those are big problems for that story. Rogue is tight. It's very structurally sound and it follows the beats of the narrative pretty clearly. It just fails to make the characters interesting. It fails to make their motivations believable and it fails to take advantage of the like ideological, you know, center that it really should have been built over. That makes some really interesting case studies, I think, in terms of how storytelling can go wrong in an AC game. I, I actually, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you. I think I think the game definitely suffers from, from an identity crisis. They don't know if they want you to be a full-blown assassin murderer or they want you to be a hero. Or they want you to also be a hero that's a Templar and all the other Templars are heroes. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's so, it's so weird because we've seen throughout the games that there are Templars that are just you know, pieces of shit, and there are assassins that aren't great. And this game was actually primed to take advantage of those extremes. And maybe you are a Templar that's perhaps a little more like Haytham, who clearly has, you know, a soft spot for people he cares about and ultimately thinks he's doing the right thing. Haytham actually is in a really interesting position because he comes from a line of assassins 
or not so much a line, but he comes from. He comes from a, an assassin. Comes from an assassin. It's just you know, it's just, it's just so interesting how like Haytham actually would have been a more interesting um, assassin, you know, or a potential assassin turned Templar game than we would have seen uh, with with with, yeah. with with Shay. Yeah, it's just there's a there's a lot of things that it could have done. They don't really do any of them well. It just kind of <laughs> try. It just kind of like it just kind of flops around and tries all of them at once and. Uh, yeah, it's just not to backtrack too much, but it would have been more difficult to kill these assassins if they all didn't hate you. Like if they all were sad to see you be a Templar and they were and they were also like, well, I'm glad you're alive, but they also also try and murder you. So whatever. <laughs> it's yeah. fucking ridiculous. So I think we've pretty much summed up our thoughts on Rogue, have we not? Uh, thank you for listening to this episode and hearing us express our opinions on Rogue. As always, you can leave us a comment. Follow us on Twitter at Hookblade. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, it does help us out if you turn on that bell icon and get notifications about future episodes. Uh, so we appreciate you guys listening. And I've been the Hook. I've been the Blade. And we will see you next week. <laughs>